live in a world in which scientific discoveries made in the past have revolutionized how we live our lives today. Thanks to early pioneers of science, such as Michael Faraday and the discovery of electricity in the 1800s, its production and control underpin much of what we take for granted today. Our health formed our understanding with his discovery regarding the circulation of blood around the body. As mankind reaches out to the stars, looking to colonize new planets, we remember one of the greatest scientific thinkers of his time. by standing on the shoulders of giants. Scientific curiosity begins at an early age. So it is vital that we inspire and encourage the young people in our schools and colleges. We need to foster within them the same spirit of pioneering discovery that motivated their forefathers. Yet the question is, is our education system doing this? We need to ask, are our children being taught how to think critically? Or are they being told what to think without question? Are they encouraged to consider theories that may fit observed facts more accurately than currently accepted views? Teach them how to think for themselves how to evaluate evidence, and how to disagree with you. While an excellent statement, yet, is such critical thinking encouraged in both the science classroom and the laboratory? The spirit of discovery seeks to promote the academic freedom for our children, to explore and follow scientific evidence, wherever that may lead. In this film, we aim to discover what motivated those great thinkers in the history of science. Why and how did they seek so purposefully to unravel the mysteries of the natural world? Despite popular belief, religious conviction is not a barrier to scientific enterprise. Experimental science began in Western Europe from around the year 1500. And indeed, it was the Christian worldview of Isaac Newton and those whom he called giants, world, and the biblical record how we should inspire the young people of today. As one involved in education, I know what I want to see in the science classroom. I want to see a free spirit of inquiry where children are presented with the strongest version of each case. Okay class, we're now going to do our own independent research. My name is Dr Sylvia Baker. I have two biology degrees, a BSc and an MSc. I have experience of working in a neuroscience laboratory and I also taught science to school children uh, teenagers but younger ones sometimes too uh, for 27 years and uh, for some of that time I was a head teacher. Subsequently I went into academic research researching different kinds of education particularly with science teaching. Throughout the Spirit of Discovery project we will be hearing from a number of respected scientists who are keen to see critical thinking in the science classroom. I see this as a very exciting project just would like to see their message placed within this wider context of the history of science, the philosophy of science, and what really underlies the current controversies 
about science. I think most people would be fascinated to learn what historians of science are currently coming up with and why did science begin here in Europe? Why didn't it begin somewhere else? So I'm very glad of this project to describe things like this, which I think are absolutely vital for education, because how can children really evaluate what's going on? Actually, how we've arrived at, at these controversies and what really underlies them. We're now going to do our own independent research. Get into pairs from last lesson, and having made your observations from last week, consider how to investigate your ideas from reliable sources. You can use the science textbooks and laptops available. In this first example of investigation, two of our students seek to find answers regarding birds in flight. Professor Andy McIntosh, an expert in flight in both birds and machines, Flight doesn't come easily. Flight has involves many control surfaces. For an aeronautical engineer designing aeroplanes cannot have come about by any random effect. It's got to be done by design. The principles of flight are to do with wings, obviously we all know that, but you've got to make sure that greater than the track. If any one of these goes wrong, that's curtains. You're not going to make it. I think there is only one explanation and that is that birds are actually specially designed creatures to use flight. While it can be clearly seen that flight in the mechanical world requires intelligent design, Professor Andy McIntosh explains the principles of bird flight. The general principle is this, that a bird's got to have feathers, but he's also got to have feathers in the right place. So you have primary feathers, you have secondary feathers, you have tertiary feathers, you have covert feathers, which are near the front, but then you have secondary coverts as well. He's got to have the right breathing system. A bird's got to have the right bone structure. You've got to have special muscles in order to lift the humerus bone. When you see eagles flying, the aerodynamics of those wings are just dramatic. But a bird's got to be able to actually look after its feathers. How does it look after its feathers? Well, it actually does it by getting to a special gland at the base of its spine. You've got to be able to turn your head 180 degrees and it puts the oil then on its feathers. And if it's a water bird in particular, the water then just flows off. The combination a flight feather right at the end of the wing, just like aircraft have today, by the way, winglets have actually been copied from the birds. Now, a buzzard feather has an amazing structure, which all feathers have, which is only seen under the microscope. This feather is, if I get it here and separate it, you say, oh, that's a pity. It's spoilt the hanging together of this feather. Ah, but of course that's constantly happening in flight. So how does a bird preen its feathers? Now look, watch this. Even though I haven't got preening oil, if I do this, that which was separated now comes back together again. But well, what's going on? If we look at this under a microscope, you will see that not only are there barbs, which you can see with the naked eye, you can see here a lot of what looks like fur. It's barbules. One side will have hooks on, and the barbules coming from this other side have ridges, rather like curtain rails. The hooks are gripping the ridged barbules on the other side. And so the feather 
is reconstituted again. And that's what a bird is doing when it preens its feathers. It just makes is energy management and fuel efficiency. Body fat is what a bird uses for fuel. And this particularly becomes uh, evident when birds migrate. The Pacific Golden Plover flies from the west coast, northwest coast of America to Hawaii, about 3,000 miles. Now, what's a bird going to do? It's all very well for a pilot who knows where he's going. He knows, he's got a map, he knows where the, the islands are. He says, OK, I need so much fuel, I've got so much weight. These guys have got loads of holiday baggage with them. Cool, look, the plane's this heavy, we need some more fuel. What's a bird going to do? Well, a bird's got to actually work out how much to eat. Now, if the bird eats too much, ooh, you know, it's halfway across to Hawaii, it goes straight, can't reach. That, you know, it's too heavy. Now, just supposing it eats too little, well, again, it runs out of energy, and again, it goes straight into the drink. That's the end of that Pacific Golden Plover. Well, did you know this, that Pacific Golden Plovers always make it to the Hawaii Islands? Consider Golden Plover chicks. Having never made the journey before, how do they know These really show to us that energy management isn't a random matter. It didn't evolve. It's actually a reflection of probably to do with a design feature which is in the brains of these birds, if you like, in the software, which is giving instructions as to what is needed for survival. This is not evolution in action. This is a design feature in action. A hummingbird, in particular, shows the sophisticated engineering that's involved. We all know that aerobatics is marvellous. All these wonderful aeroplanes which do dramatic aerodynamics for us, they pale into insignificance compared to the rapid motion of a hummingbird, which not only does aerobatics, but... In aviation, in uh, aerospace, things must be right. If you get it wrong, it's catastrophic. Everything is telling me the irreducible complexity, nothing works unless everything works, is indicating design. Having listened to an overview of the complexities of flight in both the mechanical and natural world, our students proceed to a PowerPoint presentation entitled, How Do Birds Fly? as outlined in the Ofsted recommendation, where pupils should be encouraged to recognize the power of rational explanation and develop a sense of excitement and curiosity about natural phenomena. Machines are designed to fit the task they are supposed to do. They need to work. Often we use what we see in nature to enhance and inform the way we design something. Nature is full of design templates. There's something here about a flying machine being based on a dragonfly. In this section, our students will look into the complexity of machines in nature. For the computer, but the We learned about you look online. Professor Stephen Taylor specializes in electromagnetics and physical electronics at the University of Liverpool. Let me talk to you about machines in nature and machines uh, that we find in our homes, for example. In our homes, in the places we work, there are hundreds of electrical machines in the vacuum cleaner in the dishwasher, in the washing machine, etc., etc., etc. And of course, each of these electrical machines will normally have 
a rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and is a means of converting electrical energy into mechanical energy, or in some cases, the converse. And when we look into nature, when we look into the cell, we find machines, molecular machines, at the nanoscale level. What do I mean by the nanoscale and micro level? Well, a micro, a micron is, is, a, is a thousandth of a millimeter. It's a millionth of a meter. We're talking on the level of, of a human hair or that sort of size. But then when we go a thousand times smaller and we're talking about a nanometer, 10 to the minus nine of a meter or a billionth But the difference is this, whereas our machines might be 80 or 90 or 95% efficient, the ATP synthase molecular motor has a staggering level of efficiency that far surpasses anything that we can do. It's almost 100% efficient. And of course, if it wasn't, because if the ATP stop, you stop, your energy goes. So I asked the question, how can it be possible for a machine that we cannot build and we cannot uh, surpass in terms of performance, it also has a rotor, a stator, a drive shaft and a means of converting electrical energy into mechanical energy. How can this machine have come by a chance, by a random process? So every computer system has got two components or two parts to it. There's a hardware part. which is the memory and so on and so forth. But to process the information in that computer, we need a software program. And just like the, the case and the electronics needs a designer to make it all work together well, you also need a programmer to write the program and the program has to marry in to the hardware that's in the case. Memories of 500 gigabytes, even a terabyte are not uncommon these days even on portable electronic devices. Extremely complex, very difficult, and requires top-level people to be able to program such devices. But then when we look to the cell, when we look to the human life or animal life, we find a totally much more complex level of uh, sophistication in the software in the cell. And just like it would be unthinkable to say that any computer program has written it. Every computer program has a programmer and behind all of that complex machinery that, that govern the way we live, the way we breathe, the way we interact with our environment, there's a programmer, there's a designer. And just like the software has to work well with the hardware in a computer system, so in our, in our lives the, the, the coding that makes us what we are has to interact well with the components of our body. We look at something like the human brain, we see an unparalleled level of complexity, more connections in the brain uh, than um, the world's biggest and most sophisticated computers. And to suggest or to suppose that this has come by chance seems to me absolutely impossible. The microscopic world of machines in nature is without doubt a remarkable topic. But how does the view that such complexity can appear without the existence of intelligent information at its source? There's another problem with the trial and error idea of design by, by an in, unintelligent uh, source, an unintelligent uh, entity such as an evolutionary or a random type of process. And that is that normally uh, such organisms to come about would have had to have gone through unfavorable stages to get to the end product. Well, of course, if something is going through an unfavorable stage or a stage in which the design that it has or the way in which it operates doesn't actually work,
is, is going to be worse than as if that design was directed by a, a designer who knows what he wants to achieve, who's working to a plan, who's working to a purpose, and who brings things together in harmony. An unguided design approach will never achieve what a, a guided approach can achieve. On a more humorous note, Professor Stephen Taylor explains the difficulties engineers experience when trying to copy the complex receptors in a dog's nose. Well, for the last few years, I've had the privilege of uh, working with the security uh, project, with a security project called Sniffles. It's a European project, and the aim is to protect Europe's borders from incursions by terrorists, uh, those with a, a hidden agenda, and of course, sometimes a hidden explosive. And so we've been developing techniques uh, for detection of explosives, of drugs, uh, of illicit substances at extremely low levels. The way this is normally done now at border security checkpoints is using sniffer dogs. And that's for good reason, because the sniffer dog has an amazingly sensitive uh, olfactory a device, a machine, that can emulate, that can work with a sniffer dog in order to be able to do what the dog can do, but of course to be able to do it 24-7, which no living thing can, can, can do, dogs included. The problem we've got is that the dog is just far out there in terms of its capability. And anything that we can do at a machine level cannot yet come close to the sniffing capabilities that the dog has in its nose. And so that's the project I've been working on for the last four or five years. Uh, we are still a long way from meeting the specification, meeting the requirement of being able to sense and to sniff as well as a dog. Engineering, of course, is all about problem solving. It's mathematical models with the most sophisticated design, bringing together teams of people highly intelligent, each with perhaps a different specialism, to focus their minds upon the task in hand. What it is not at all about is in just waiting for the problem to somehow solve itself. It's as far from random as in fact you can, you can imagine, and it is all about focused intelligence. I ask myself, smaller scale and to a higher level of sophistication, I ask myself, how could these things have come other than by the work of a designer? Having considered machines on a nanoscale, our next topic will discover wonderful mechanisms in a much larger creature. In this example, the students are using a popular science website to discover facts regarding the giraffe. Wow, giraffe's neck is up to 1.8 metres long. That's obviously so they can reach the leaves at the top of the trees. Could it be so that they can see predators? And how did they get so long? Why don't you try and find somebody who knows? Professor Stuart Burgess, an award-winning scientist at Bristol University, explains. The giraffe's neck is supposed to be a classic example of evolution. What we read in textbooks is that natural selection, favoured longer necks, enables a giraffe to reach higher food. And because of the survival advantages, the neck that actually happened. Even in theory, it's a scientific fact that there are limits to change. For example, if you go to a dog breeder and you said, can you breed me a dog with a very, very, very long neck, so it's like a giraffe dog, uh, the breeder will say, well, I can't do that because if I carry on breeding, neck can change. The seven cervical vertebrae of the giraffe's neck are remarkable. Each have a ball and socket joint that can twist 360 degrees. A giraffe's neck can be up to 1.8 metres. One of the uh, challenges for a giraffe is if it drops its head down to the ground, for example, to drink water, its head is moving through a distance of six metres. Now, that could be fatal for a creature because the blood can rush to the brain, it can uh, cause great 
damage can be fatal. The giraffe has very special features in its neck. For example, called the reti mirabili and that allows blood to be diverted from the, the brain in case the, the head is lowered and that stops this excessive blood pressure. As well as the network of vessels there are sensors and control mechanisms that uh, make the blood move away from the brain back to the heart. They have valves in them such that if the giraffe drops its head, the, the valve stop the blood rushing back to the head. So the giraffe's neck has this complex plumbing uh, and technology to regulate the pressure in the brain. It's an amazing design. When considering the theory of evolution, it's important to realize it's not based on observational science. It's based on speculative science. Really, it's a type of philosophy. So when scientists are studying adaptation and microevolution the origin of life and they talk about the origin of flight that is speculative science it's not based on observational science uh, because the giraffe has so many uh, intricate design features engineers have been interested to look at it to see if they can be inspired to produce better engineering It has a powerful heart and high blood pressure, it needs tight skin. And NASA have looked at the skin of the giraffe to inspire better spacesuits because uh, astronauts need tight spacesuits in space. So giraffes have inspired uh, NASA designers. I've had the privilege of working on some of the most advanced cutting edge pieces of technology. And one of the things I found is that despite uh, the high level of engineering we have, it does not match the level of engineering that we see in the natural world. Like Professors Macintosh and Taylor, Professor Burgess also highlights the principle of Evidences for intelligent design are irreducible mechanisms. These are mechanisms that need several parts simultaneously to have a useful function. What I've been studying in the human knee joint is what's called a four bar mechanism. If I invert that, I get an inverted four bar parallelogram mechanism. And this is the hinge which is operating in so the bones, the femur bone and the tibia bone. And what this is, is a precision mechanism. It's a wonderful mechanism for guiding your bones. And it's such an elegant mechanism that engineers are using this to inspire the design of better robots. Engineers know that a four bar mechanism cannot evolve step by step. You need all four bars and all four pins simultaneously. And there is no evidence that that could evolve step by step. Uh, in fact, no evolutionist can even explain how it In 1965, Sussex University, where they were just setting up their biology department under the work of the Dean, Professor John Maynard Smith, who was a leading academic, a leading biologist, and a leading expert on evolution. I went there to do my BSc, biology degree, and I found that I had an excellent science training there. I was taught to critique, think critically about everything. Um, I was an evolutionist, I went as a convinced evolutionist, although I didn't find the evidence that convincing at A-level, but I thought it didn't make me doubt evolution, I thought there'll be more evidence when I get to university. To my astonishment, I found that when it came to the topic of evolution, it sounded a lot more vague. It didn't seem where a certain topic just didn't seem to be possible. The way that the invertebrate eye, the insect eye, for example, had evolved into a vertebrate eye, an eye like ours. In those days, they believed that it happened. They don't believe it now, interestingly. So we argued round in circles about 
how this could have happened because they're completely different systems. Nobody could see in the slightest how it could have happened. It's not working. Shouldn't we just suggest that perhaps it hasn't happened? And at that point, there was a shocked silence. And then one of the other students began to mock me for believing in God. But I hadn't, I did believe in God as it happened, but I hadn't mentioned God at all. I was trying to argue from the evidence. And that was bad enough. But then what was worse was that the person leading the seminar closed it down and said, I'm not prepared to have any controversy. And it came home to me then that this was not science, this was something else. That was my first Dr. Sylvia Baker is clear that evolution isn't science at all but an unprovable belief system which is being imposed uncritically in our classrooms and laboratories. Our final pair of students in this film are investigating DNA, the remarkable molecule of life itself. This is really complicated. Mm. There's so much to learn. Mm. All I can remember is that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic bronochleric acid. I would like to know if DNA could explain how simple organisms evolve into complex ones. True. Well, it is the view of many scientists, but you need to find out for yourselves, really. Why don't you look it up? The others have found this really good website which lets you ask the experts. What should we find out about the map and the information DNA contains sounds interesting. Should we research that? Our two experts will explain some of the levels of functional complexity which biochemists are still unravelling. Geneticist and molecular biologist Dr Georgia Purdom from Ohio State University, USA. So DNA is really sort of the library of the cell because it contains information, much like a library has all the G is the letters that they're known by, and they're arranged in different orders and different organisms to give um, different information. So some of that information is on how to make proteins, which are sort of the workhorses and make up our bodies. Um, the other information is regulatory. So how do you regulate that? And what's amazing is that really only about in human that DNA codes for proteins. The other 98% has been called junk. Okay, but it's not, right? We, the more and more we research it and study it, the more we realize that it's actually regulating that 2%. It's really important. It's what makes a, a liver cell different from a brain cell. Dr. Nigel Robinson gained his PhD from the University of Nottingham for research into DNA and worked as a lecturer for over 20 years. He will point out the incredible molecular machine called ATP synthase, which provides the energy And so when they discovered it, they didn't know what it did. Watson was a biochemist, Crick was a physicist, and they got together at Cambridge with the aim of unravelling the structure of DNA. From their work, they finally cracked the genetic code, which explained how DNA can make proteins. DNA is a very complex molecule. It's a long, thin string of many molecules all joined together, like a string of beads. But to a lot of energy and this is done in even the simplest cells by a little molecular machine called ATP synthase. 
So ATP synthases are proteins that basically form to synthesize ATP, and they're very much like molecular motors. Um, and so in how all of the components have to move in a certain way, basically by changing shape, this sort of drives this thing around and around like a little machine, like a motor, and the output of that is ATP, which is the energy molecule. And again, if any one of those components, because it's made up of many, many different is very problematic because how do you evolve each of those in a stepwise fashion over millions of years and then them all come together to be able to do this? It's just not possible. DNA does not fit in with the evolutionary model because when you study how it works, how complex way of reading the DNA to produce proteins, no scientist any longer believes that DNA was the first genetic material. It could not have happened by itself. So something else must have been there first, but for which there's no experimental evidence. For me, being a molecular geneticist and really studying the cell and DNA, uh, it's just one of my favorite things because when I look at that and I think it's so complex, how could anyone look at that and think, oh yeah, that just came about by random chance over eons of time? Because it truly is this like amazing factory with like all these little parts doing their own jobs um, to be able to filaments and we actually have these proteins um, called kinesins and dyneins that they're motor proteins is, is kind of the generic term but they literally walk I mean they literally walk down these microtubules and these microfilaments carrying cargo from one part of the cell to the other because I think I think people have this idea that the cell is just sort of this unorganized chaos and it's nothing like that because it has to be very efficient and so it is very organized um, and and can move things from one part to the other very specifically and we still don't even have we have some understanding of that like how it moves and it's using energy and, and things like that and kind of walking down but how does it know where to go how does it know to take this cargo to this location we're still trying to figure all those things out and so um, as much as we know I always say the more that we look into it the more we realize we don't know and so it really just is um, a testament to uh, this this requires a designer this can't come about everything has to work together uh, all of it has to be there at the at the same time or you won't have a working cell you won't have a, a living organism then uh, how simple bacteria each one of those reactions requires its own unique enzyme so to have 30,000 chemicals all being processed, you need 30,000 different enzymes. Sometimes I liken that to a, um, the transportation map of a city the size of Birmingham, with all its buses and bus stops and trains and railway stations. The human cell is more complicated than Birmingham's transportation system. Both Georgia and Nigel are agreed that such complex molecules as DNA, ATP synthase and kinesin could never have arisen randomly by the chance processes that Charles Darwin speculatively proposed in his Origin of Species when he first suggested the idea of natural of evolution by natural selection, it, he didn't understand genetics. I mean, there was Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who's considered sort of the father of genetics. I mean, he had done his work, but then it had kind of been lost um, for a period of time. It wasn't rediscovered really till after Darwin. So he didn't really understand how things were inherited from one organism um, to another. So obviously our understanding of genetics has just, especially since the discovery of the structure of DNA with Watson and Crick in the mid 50s, 1950s, has really, that's when we sort of saw the genetic age really come into being and with all the technology that we have available today, it really has helped us understand it better. And that's why I say for me as a geneticist, 
to look at this and have and work alongside people, you know, when I was in graduate school that that believe this just came about um, over eons of time by chance. Whether the scientific giants of the past could have achieved their great breakthroughs if they had been the victims of a similar straitjacket around their thinking. To summarize our journey throughout this presentation, history attests to a long line of scientists who not only believed in an intelligent creator, but stood at the very front of achievements in science. The history of science is actually a fascinating topic that should be given to the young people in the schools as part of inspiring them to becoming, perhaps, world-changing scientists themselves. According The worldview that arose out of the Reformation that is what has given rise to modern science. Now this is the opposite of what a lot of school children will be believing. They think that science has disproved the Bible. Many people today have the misconception that religion, and especially Bible-based faith, is somehow in conflict with science. Galileo, for example, is often portrayed as a hero of science who battled the religious authorities of his day. Yet the truth is Galileo believed what the Bible implied. That Copernican cosmology was not in conflict with God's word and indeed excitement gripped these early pioneers of science. Excitement gripped people in the 16th and 17th century that maybe, maybe they could light and some of Newton's important experiments were to do with light because he was fascinated with God and so these early scientists they were just really as theologians wanting to understand the world around them for example Robert Boyle the father of modern chemistry was also a Bible believing Christian and as you go through and see the people who today would be called the father of physics as Newton is, the father of modern chemistry, as Boyle is, the people who are designated the father of their subject almost always have turned out to be Bible-believing Christians. In the late 1800s, discoveries by Louis Pasteur and Gregor Mendel would challenge evolutionary thinking. Darwinism amongst biologists went into disrepute for 20 years, and I don't know if most people realize that. Maybe the ordinary person still believed it, but the scientists, the biologists, were very wary of it because what Mendel had discovered didn't fit with Darwinism at all because for Darwinism to work, you need new structures coming in from somewhere and know that it was resurrected in the 20s, 30s and 40s by a group of people who deliberately set out to rescue it. So, for 20 years at least, more than that, Darwin's theory of evolution amongst biologists was dead in the water. Two leading biologists of the 19th century were Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who, who was the father of modern genetics, and Louis Pasteur, who was the father of no end of subjects. In 1866, the Augustinian monk Gregor Mendel, who by careful observation and meticulous study of pea plants, would formulate the laws of heredity, for which he is rightly famous today. His research showed that genetic information could be shuffled, but not added to, nor created anew. Professor of Chemistry Louis Pasteur's belief in a creator god opposed Charles Darwin and set up a famous experiment to debunk the theory of spontaneous generation, the belief that life could have arisen from non-living matter by random chance processes in a chemical soup. Louis Pasteur produced enormous benefits to mankind, but some of them were linked to his belief in creation. And that, for example, 
He disproved the idea of spontaneous generation, which meant that Clark Maxwell, to name two. Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell both worked on what became theories to do with electricity and magnetism. Michael Faraday was arguably the greatest experimental scientist of all time, whose work provided the foundation for the remarkable theories of James Clark Maxwell and Albert Einstein. Like Maxwell, Faraday was a passionate Bible-believing Christian. Even Einstein, a secular Jew, made reference to God in his work. Faraday and Maxwell, very different people. One took a more practical approach and one, the other one lived somewhere completely different and took the more theoretical approach. But between them, they have led to everything that has come from our use of and understanding of electricity. Imagine how significant that is. Is Bible-based faith really in conflict with science? The scientists who are successful very often were Bible-believing scientists. And now we come to the present day where many people believe that belief in the Bible hinders good science. Now, if this is not the case, the children in the schools deserve to know it. And we need to look at the modern scientists, have their worldviews influence them for good in the science that they're doing. young people should be free to discover this for themselves and not be censored from even raising the issue in the classroom. We ask the question, what is science? The four principles of science are observation, investigation, evaluation and application. All steps that are important when exploring a hypothesis. Through careful observation, it prompts investigation. This is followed by an evaluation of data and may result in application. Whether we look at the marvel of birds in flight, the astonishing nano world of the molecular machines found in every living cell, the intricate valve network in the giraffe's neck, or the staggering insights being discovered Surely we must conclude that the evidence for intelligent design deserves to be explored by free-thinking young people in our classrooms. In regard to the government's desire to include critical thinking in the science curriculum, evolutionary ideas are not good science because actually they're taking their evolutionary ideas, their philosophy, their worldview first and then fitting the scientific facts into it. That's not the way to do science. The way to do science is to actually look at the scientific evidence first, write down what's there, describe it, do, do all the proper uh, observational science, then say, okay, what's this implying? What's the best way to understand how this creature came into being. And when you do that, as I've been repeatedly saying, there is irreducible complexity. The, the feather system is not going to work unless you have a preening gland as well, as less, unless you have the ability to turn your head 180 degrees to get to the gland and so on and so forth. The breathing system is not going to work unless you've got the movable sternum bone and the hinged ribs in order to breathe. investigation that evolution is not the way hypothesis actually really does.
So my advice to any student going into the scientific field, let me say, I think you're making a good choice. It really is an exciting world to work into, but you have to think critically. You really do. And when you're told anything, you have to ask why. And you have to think outside of the box. Some of the greatest uh, inventions we've ever made as humans have been with engineers thinking outside of the normal uh, train lines. You have to think critically. You have to demand the evidence why something is true. You have to think out of the box and above all, ask the difficult questions. I think one of the important things for students is to understand the difference between observational science and speculative science. Uh, I, I do a lot of observational science. I do bio-inspired design where I would do tests on a bird wing and see how the results of those tests could be used to monkey to man charts they're based on someone's speculation someone's idea and very often they're not based on observational science so it's good to see that difference between observational science and speculative science so when it comes to the the evolution creation issue um, especially in the school system a lot of people um, will ask is that do you think that's important you know as part of like critical thinking and, and I say absolutely um, because a lot of things that you study in school are things that you can definitively know from, let's say, textbooks or something that's been observed in the recent past. We have eyewitnesses. There's certain rules for it, like English grammar and all of that. But when it comes to evolution and creation, it is very much a different issue because it's historical science. It's not observable. It's not tested. internet age that we live in, they're being bombarded with all better discerning as, as individuals and, and, really, and really thinking about these issues and not just accepting what people say, but really looking into them for themselves. We need to develop critical thinking in our young scientists. We don't want them just to accept what they're being told. And when it comes to science, we should get the students to say, I want to see experimental evidence for what you are telling me. And if there are no experimental evidence, you say, well, how do you know it's true? It's never been observed. We want students to think in this sort of way. And so my advice to young students would be to say, when someone tells you something scientifically, you ask yourself, where is the experimental evidence for that? We conclude this investigation by quoting the Charter of the Royal Society, founded in London. and to encourage the development and use of science for the benefit of humanity. The Latin motto of the Royal Society is explained by Professor Andy McIntosh. I'd like to say that critical thinking is extremely important. We should not be teaching students what to think. We should be teaching students how to think. As the Royal Society has a motto, that is Latin for saying, on the word of no one or you might put it in common parlance, on the authority of nobody. In other words, nobody has a special place with their own pet theory saying, this is what happened. Now, that's a very good motto, but even the Royal Society today is not really following its own motto. Rather, what's tending to happen is that people are being told, you must have this in the curriculum. You must actually say, that this happened, that happened, and the other happened. You must be talking about millions of years. Why so? Well, because it's proven, isn't it? We, we know that everything evolved. That's what will be said. In other words, the philosophy is leading, the hypothesis is leading, and critical thinking
do science based on observation. There must be a number of hypotheses as to how something came about. And maybe one hypothesis is the idea of evolution, which I'm using the term evolution to mean that one creature changed into another, that new information came without any information base, no, without a mind behind it. OK, that's the hypothesis. Well, but equally well, another hypothesis is that there is a design here and that the design, of course, immediately has philosophical implications. But even though it has massive philosophical implications, and by the way, so does evolution, we must nevertheless, in the science classroom, consider all possibilities. And there may be other theories out there, other hypotheses, I should say. Education is not about force-feeding children facts or brainwashing them with facts. It is about teaching them to think teaching them to think critically, teaching them to debate, teaching them to inquire and to wonder. And that's what I want to see happening in the classroom. Force feeding them, brainwashing them, is something that we should be very wary of, very afraid of. And the boot is on the other foot in this issue because it is often the people who believe in intelligent design who want the debate and the people who believe in evolution who do not want the debate. And they are closing down critical thinking and could rightly be accused of brainwashing. If future generations of scientists are to be successful in their research and discoveries, our young people must be encouraged to follow the evidence wherever it may lead.